Hello, my name is Holly, and welcome to Church at the Corner Online. We're honored that you've chosen to join us this morning, and we hope that you're going to find this time encouraging and helpful. If you're joining us for the very first time, we would love to know that, and we would also like to get a gift card in your hands as our way of saying thanks. If you would please text Corner BG, that's Corner BG, to 833-222-2630, we will respond with your gift card. Today, Pastor Tim is continuing his series called My Big Fat Mouth, and he'll be talking about how our words can either negatively or positively affect us, and most especially, our words can affect others. Thanks again for joining us, and let's get started. part two of a message series that we're calling My Big Fat Mouth. And what I want to talk to you about today is how our big fat mouth gets us in trouble sometimes by criticizing. And when I say criticizing, I'm not talking about positive feedback, constructive feedback that we give people that we care about and want to help them to get better. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the critical nitpicking, unkind, uninformed, cruel at times criticism that so often goes on. And obviously in this day in social this day of social media has caused it to be even worse because people can criticize you publicly and not have to face you necessarily. So criticism is really a problem. And some of you right now, maybe seated next to a husband or wife or whatever, and you may be kind of punching them because you're glad that they're sitting there listening to this uh, because you think they need to hear it. Um, And you're probably thinking about all the people that you can't wait to share this with. Uh, But I want to remind you that this message is called My Big Fat Mouth, not Their Big Fat Mouth. Because the problem of criticism really is difficult to see in the mirror because we hate it when often people criticize us, but we often don't realize when we're criticizing other people because we often feel justified in our criticizing because, you know, maybe if they weren't so weird or stupid, maybe they wouldn't have spent money in such an unwise way, then we wouldn't criticize them. Because after all, we know what's best for their life, don't we? You know, I think it's interesting that, um, again, we, we use social media today so much in ways to criticize people because we don't have to face them. Um, and it's really easy to do it now, more so than it was when I was younger. But But I think... In this series, one of the things that I really want you to understand is how powerful words are, negatively and positively. So today I want to go to a a very popular verse in the Bible, and if you're not a Christian, you may actually know this verse. Chances are, though, that there are very few of you that actually know the verse that comes after this very popular verse. So I'm going to look at the popular verse first, and then we're going to look at the verse that comes afterwards. And we find this uh, over in the book of Galatians. This was a a, a letter that Paul wrote to to the believers in an area called Galatia. So thus this writing is called Galatians. And in Galatians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, he says there that the whole law can be summed up in one command. It's love your neighbor as yourself. Most of us know that, and we love that verse, and it feels good to love your neighbor as yourself. But then he goes on to say, but if you are always biting 
and devouring one another, watch out. Be aware of destroying one another. Love your neighbor as yourself, but be careful. If your words are constantly critical, if you're always cutting into people and cutting down people, if you're always harsh with your words, be careful because that can destroy one another. What if for some of you, your critical words were actually destroying the potential that maybe you have for intimacy in your marriage? What if your critical words were driving a wall between you and your children? What if they were critical words that were keeping you from sharing the goodness of Jesus with others because those people can't get over how critical you are about anything and everything. Again, Paul reminds us here that we're to be careful that your words don't wind up hurting those around you. And a critical spirit can do that very quickly. There's a couple other verses I, I want us to look, and I, I kind of call these con contrasting verses. Um, and there's, there are contrasting verses in the Bible. And I didn't say contradictory. I said contrasting. They'll say one thing about a subject, and then they'll say something completely opposite about the very same subject. And in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, we see one side of it. And where it says some people make what we call cutting remarks. I mean, you know, just those little critical, I call them cutting drop-in remarks. Like maybe if you're older and you live away from distance from your parents and your mom happens to ask you, did you lose your phone? And you're like, well, no, mom, I have my phone. Why? Well, because you haven't called me in two weeks. I could have been dead and nobody would have known about it. See, it's those little cutting remarks that are critical. And some people do those, use those a lot and aren't even aware that they're doing that. But here's the other side where words can actually bring healing, not cutting. Some people cut, hurt, and criticize, but other people speak words of wisdom. And those words can actually build you up. They don't tear you down. They can create healing. That's the power of words. In Ephesians 4.29, again, the Apostle Paul is writing there, and he basically says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. He says, don't let unhelpful, unwholesome Impure words come out of your mouth, especially towards others. Don't tear other people down. Let the only words you speak be words that are helpful for building up others according to their needs. You know, I think about this in a practical sense when I was younger playing sports, and it was really the, it was the difference in coaches. I seem to always have a coach, no matter what sport I was playing. One of the coaches would be that coach that would just criticize. He would find everything wrong with what I was doing. But then I would have the other coach who would build me up despite of what I was doing. And I, I, I think about that and the, how much impact both of those um, coaches had on me. Obviously, the one was a very negative impact. Didn't have a lot of respect for that man. Uh, matter of fact, outside of that setting, it even affected my respect for him. Where the other man, the coach that constantly would build me up, uh, have continued respect for him even today. So here, here's kind of what I hope you'll understand is you have no idea whatsoever how a single word of criticism can pierce someone's soul and stick with them for years and years. I just gave you an example of that. And on the other side, you have no idea how God can use a single word of encouragement 
to build someone up, to give them the faith to go on. Because our words have a lot of power. Some people make cutting remarks, but others use wisdom to bring about healing. And again, you have no idea how one word of encouragement, how God can use that to build faith and hope in someone who needs it. I'm going to put this on the screen. It says, our words have the power of life, and they have the power of death. So I want to ask you this. What kind of person do you want to be? Which pers- what type of person do you want to be known as? And I, I give you two options. We're going to look at two options this morning. The first type is what I call a fault finder. A fault finder. And this, quite honestly, is what most people are. We tend to look at people to try to find what's wrong before we find what's right. It's intuitive in us. I mean, if you're married, I mean, be careful. Because it's easy to become a fault finder. You can take a relatively good person and pick them apart before you even get to lunch that day. I don't like the way you walk. Or I don't like the way you chew. I don't like the, the way you, you, you leave your socks laying around. I don't like the jokes you tell. I don't like the way you snore. I don't like the way you, be, you breathe at night when you're asleep. Some of you are probably laughing because you've you've had that conversation. I mean, you, you you can go into the office and somebody may say they don't like the way that you have your desk arranged or you don't like the way your boss runs the meetings. You don't like the way somebody talks. I think we do this intuitively and sometimes don't even realize we're doing it. I mean, again, back to social media. I mean, I, man, I can't believe the picture that she just posted on Instagram. She says she loves Jesus, but it looks like she loves her body more. Or maybe you criticize the way other people raise their kids. I mean, you may, you, this may have come out of your mouth. If they're going to raise their kids like that, they might as well go ahead and put them in prison right now because those kids don't stand a chance or you don't like the way somebody drives their car, or whatever. It is so easy to be a fault finder. And if you're a fault finder, let me remind you that you're a lot like the guys in the Old Testament known as the Pharisees. Because this is exactly what the Pharisees did. They lived for this. But you're not only like the Pharisees, you're actually like the devil. Because one of the names of the devil is he's the deceiver. He's the devourer. He's the prince of darkness. He's the father of lies. He's also called the accuser, and he is the king of criticizing. And he he goes about every day accusing people before God. He has access to the throne. He goes back and forth, and he's constantly accusing, criticizing in your name. And what's he trying to do? He's trying to find fault. I mean, that's what the Pharisees do. And that's what the devil does. And the reality is, is that that's what a lot of us do. And why do we do it? The reason a lot of times is because we're full of pride and we think we know what's best. But I also think it displays our insecurity. And therefore, we criticize others sometimes that just really kind of points out the weaknesses in ourselves. I mean, that, that's a whole different message we could talk about if we had more time. I, and I think another reason we do this is because we just don't understand. So when we criticize from a distance things that we know nothing about, I mean, for example, you could criticize a lot about the church, this church, any church. But if you had context, you might say, well, okay, no, wait a minute, I understand. Now that makes more sense. 
it's kind of like if you're somebody that's got kids, it's before you had kids. And remember, you could criticize parents all day long and how they didn't discipline their two-year-old in the grocery store. And the reason is because you'd never owned your own two-year-old and you'd never taken one to a grocery store. And when you do that, you know that you can't negotiate with terrorists, basically. So you don't really know that until you have a two-year-old. So why are you criticizing? You don't understand. And you kind of create this whole mindset about this, this particular person in regards to being a parent, bad parenting. But once you've had a two-year-old, you just understand, well, you just got to surrender. I give up. You can have the candy. I'll buy you a Porsche. You can have a pony. Just get in the car. Quit pulling things off the shelf. Don't embarrass us. See, you don't judge anybody because you didn't understand. And I need to tell you, when you criticize others, here's a lot of times what we're thinking. We tend to think, well, this makes me look smarter if I criticize. This makes me kind of look like an expert. This just shows how good I actually am. No, what it really does, it makes you look insecure, mean-spirited. I mean, ask yourself, have you ever met a critical person that you really wanted to be like? Have you ever met a critical person that you wanted to spend a lot of time with? In fact, speaking of critical, there's a verse actually in the Bible that talks about critical women. And I'm going to show you this verse, but I want you to understand, ladies, this is the word of God, and I'm going to pick on the men here in just a second. But Proverbs 21, 19 says, it's better to live alone in a desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. Probably got a lot of amens there. And there's not really a verse about men, but if I ever get to add a verse to the Bible, it'll be like 3 Timothy 24, 12, whatever, and it'll say something like, you women would rather have your fingernails pulled off one at a time than live with a man who constantly picks you apart. So that, that'd be the verse I would add to defend you women. And see, this deal kind of goes both ways. I've never met a critical person that I wanted to be like or be around. So I want to ask you, those of you like me that have kind of battled a critical spirit that's really difficult to see in the mirror, you're not going to see it. And because we've justified guys like me, what we do, because we feel like we actually have the right to pick other people apart, which I don't know where I got that idea. I don't know where you got that idea. Do you want to be a fault finder or do you want to be what I call a hope dealer? Hope with an H. I said hope dealer. Okay. And in Romans chapter 15, verse 13, check out what the Bible says here. It says, and in regards, do you want to be a hope dealer? Paul says this, listen to hope, listen to the hope, listen to the hope. He says, may the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him. Why? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of of the Holy Spirit. Paul was a hope dealer. He wasn't a fault finder. Anytime he'd speak, anytime he'd write, he didn't tear people down. He was going to build them up, and he did build them up. He wasn't going to let any unwholesome talk come out of his mouth. All that would come out of his mouth is that which is helpful for building life and teaching life into other people. He was the supreme hope dealer next to Jesus. In fact, if you read some of his writings, and I went and picked Romans chapter 8, um, there are so many words of hope that Paul uses there. I picked out a few high parts out of this one chapter. Listen to the hope here, some of the things he says throughout this chapter. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's hope. He said, the Holy Spirit, he helps you in your weakness. That's hope. He said, Jesus is making intercession at the right hand of God the Father right now. That's hope. That gives me hope. He said, you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. That gives me hope. He said, neither death nor life, neither demons nor angels, neither powers of the present or the future, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's hope. He was a hope dealer. So, which one of those would you rather be? Which one of those would you rather be known about when people talk about you, which we're going to talk about gossiping in two weeks, but when people talk about you, do you want them to say you're a fault finder or a hope dealer? The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil is a fault finder, but Jesus is full of hope. I I love the different metaphors of Jesus. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He's the light living vine. He's the gate. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the alpha and the omega. Let me tell you who else he is. First Timothy calls Jesus this. He's our hope. Titus 2 calls Jesus the blessed hope. And first Peter calls Jesus the living hope. And whenever someone would sin back in the days of the Pharisees, the Pharisees would point out their sin and accuse. They were, it's what they lived for. Jesus would come. He'd call sin what it is. He'd say that's sin. But then he would offer hope to walk away from the bondages of sin. I mean, let's take the example of when the woman was caught in adultery. What did the Pharisees do? Well, they surrounded her. They said, let's stone her. They quoted the law that says, put her to death. But the, and the Pharisees did everything they could to humiliate her and point out everything that was wrong. Then we see Jesus in the story. He kneels down in the sand and he starts to write something. We're not sure what he was writing. Many scholars believe, and I tend to agree, he most likely was writing something like the sins of the Pharisees. And we, we, when we read there, we see that each one of the Pharisees, from the oldest to the youngest, started walking away. And then what did Jesus do? Jesus called them out, and then they started to walk away. Then we see Jesus nailed down to the sand to this woman who was broken, full of shame. And he said to her, where are the fault finders? Where are the accusers? Where are those who tried to condemn you? And she looked up and said, they're gone. And so Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Don't do this anymore. So he acknowledges the sin. And then he says, there's a better way. He said, go your way and don't sin anymore. But you can find forgiveness. You can find life and you can find real love. So what do you want to be? You want to be that fault finder? That's what the Pharisees were. That's what the spiritual enemy is. The prince of darkness, the father of lies, the great deceiver, the accuser of the brothers. Who is Jesus? He's the way. He's the truth. He's the living hope. He's the blessed hope. He's our hope. And I hope you'll want to be a hope dealer. You know, one of the one of the great examples that was taught to me many years ago. It's an illustration that seems kind of silly that we've seen on TV and movies and all that. Is it's like we have two different people on our shoulder, on our left shoulder and our right shoulder, and when we do something, when we sin, one of those accuses us, criticizes us, gets us to doubt points out fault, but the other one, which is God, says, boy, I hate that that happened. It breaks my heart, but you're the apple of my eye. 
I love you more than you can imagine. And the guy that taught me that illustration used to say, so Tim, in that example, which one of those gives more life? Which one of those gives more hope? Well, it's pretty easy to figure that out. You know, many years ago, I was a guy that kind of criticized every, every church thing. Instead of finding the good of what God was doing, I'd try to pick it apart. And it's amazing how when I was younger, I thought I knew everything. And now that I'm older, I recognize a little more humility and how little I actually do know. But back then, I was really critical in my spirit because I was insecure. But the closer I got to God, though, the more aware I became of my sinfulness. The more I kept my eyes on the author and the perfecter of our faith, as Hebrews 12, 2 tells us, I became more aware of my sinfulness. I became more aware of my critical spirit. And the more aware I became of my sinfulness, the more I aware I became of the magnitude of God's grace. And because of who he is and what he's done for me, I will not waste time criticizing the speck in someone else's eyes when I've got a log stuck in my own eye for way too long. And because of who God is, because of what he's done, because of how he's forgiven me, because of how he's given me hope, because of how he has loved a person who didn't deserve that love, I will not tear others down. I will try to build them up as much as I can. You know, when I got to be an adult and had my own kids, I had the opportunity to coach football and baseball when, when the boys were 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And it's amazing to this day. And a lot of these young men are now in their early to mid-30s. If I come across one of them, it's amazing to me today how many of them say things like this. This happened recently to my wife, actually where she encountered one of the young men I coached baseball. And he made this comment to my wife that I was the first male in his life that never criticized him but always built him up and that to believe that he was capable of doing whatever he set his mind to instead of criticizing the mistakes he made. And that young man told my wife that that still resonates with him today, that I was the first man that did that for him. Now, I'm not trying to make me out to be some something special, but, you know, that was over 20 years ago. And for that young man to still recognize the value of that, I think teaches a lot. And we need to be rem reminded of who we are. We're people of God. We're supposed to be hope dealers. We're supposed to point people to Jesus, who is the living hope the King of Kings, the one who forgives brokenness and heals all infirmities, our Savior, our King, our Lord. We're to point people to hope. We're not fault finders. Anybody can be a fault finder. The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil is a fault finder. But we're followers of Christ. We're, we're to speak words of healing, words of life, and as I said earlier, you have no idea how a single critical word can pierce, kill, and destroy. But you also have no idea how God can use a single word of encouragement to push you forward, to build your faith, and transform you even more into the image of Christ, which allows you to be a hope dealer. You know, I want to lead a church of hope dealers, pointing people to the one who is our living hope, our Savior, our King, our Lord Jesus. So I would encourage you today to pay attention to your words. Are you finding fault or are you dealing hope? It's pretty easy to distinguish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, 
that your word can be so powerful, which then translates into our words and the power of them in the lives of people. So I, I pray based on what we've talked about today, Father, that we'll, we'll be encouraged and we'll embrace and we'll pay attention to our words. And are we, are we, do we have that critical spirit? Are we constantly criticizing? Are we finding fault? Or are we constantly encouraging and building up in spite of the faults? That's who Jesus is, and that's what this world needs to see. So, Father, help us, encourage us, empower us to be those people. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for joining us today. As always, if you found this beneficial, I hope you'll share it with somebody. And then uh, we look forward to seeing you next week for part three of My Big Fat Mouth.